Welcome to Joy for the Journey, a worship service television ministry presented by your friends at the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. This service will be uploaded to YouTube as soon as possible. Hey kids, are you looking for some fun this summer? Come join us for Vacation Bible School virtual style, an incredible world amazement park where we will take a thrill ride through God's amazing creation. Every registered student will receive a packet with craft, snack, and other goodies to go along with that day's theme. To register your student, please go to our website, joyforthejourney.org, or our church's Facebook page, and follow the registration link. Registration is now open through July 27th. We will have a couple of opportunities for drive-through packet pickup, when, which will be Saturday, August 1st, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., or Sunday, August 2nd, evening, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. VBS will run August 3rd through August 7th with new videos update the daily on our YouTube page. Ages for VBS is 3rd through 5th grade. Our prayer focus this week is VBS. Members and friends hospitalized, Roy Monson was a patient at Sarah Bush. Our heartfelt Christian sympathy goes out to Albert Elliott and family at the death of his wife, Barb Elliott, at 6.30 a.m. on Saturday. Barb's funeral will be, will be live streamed on Tuesday at 2 p.m. There is a link for the live stream on the Boone Funeral Home Facebook page. Please get on at 1.45. The visitation is 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Tuesday, and the burial will be Wednesday at 1 p.m. at Carmel Highland Cemetery. You can find information, pictures, and the obituary on the Funeral Home's Facebook page. We will also share this information on Facebook so you can see it again. Now, if you would please stand and join me in the invocation. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another day to come together and worship in your name. Lord, we pray for those who cannot be with us this morning. We pray for those who are watching online with us this morning. We pray for those who are watching this service next week on TV. Lord, we pray that you are with us in our hearts and our minds. Be with us this day and open our hearts to the words you have given Pastor Dennis to share with us. In your son's name we pray, amen. Let's lift up our voices in song. Uh-oh, my puppies. There we go.
call to worship. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. We're going to do Waymaker again so that we get it in our minds. So let's sing together.
please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, there's just something about that name. Lord, thank you for everything that you have done and everything that you continue to do. Lord, help those who aren't seeing your hand, see your hand. Because, Lord, we know that you're working in every situation. And, Lord, I just thank you for the offerings that have come in. And I thank you for the offerings that um, are still coming in. Lord, I just, um, I just thank you for, for your faithfulness to us. And, Lord, I, I thank you that this congregation has just um, followed that example of faithfulness in attendance and in giving and in doing. Lord, we just thank you and we want to honor you today in everything that we do. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Acts 4, verses 1 through 22. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. I have heard many people say that fear is as much of a disease as cancer or COVID-19. Fear corrupts the mind, the heart, the soul, much in the same way as a virus or a mutated cancer cell corrupts the physical body. This causes fear to have the power over our thoughts, actions, and our words. And yet, the Bible says not to fear 365 times, enough to be a daily reminder. First John 4, 18 and 19 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. 
The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. When we cast out our fear with the help of the daily reminders God placed in the Bible, we leave room for love, for God's love. We allow God's love to have the power over us instead of fear. This song is called the breakup song, as if to break off our relationship with fear. There is no room for fear in our lives when we fill our hearts with God's love. As much of you as I can take I'm so done So over being afraid I've gone through the motions I've been back and forth I know that you're thinking You've heard this before I don't know how to say it So I'm just gonna say it You probably never saw it coming Something's gotta give So I'll give up you Oh There's no room for you here Yeah, I've had enough There's no vacancy sign on my heart is lit up In case you didn't hear it say it, sing along with me, sing fear you don't know. Thank you, Mela. I'll, I'll say it again. I said it at 8 o'clock. Wow. Uh, awesome message. And I didn't, ma I didn't know Mela had all that soul in her. That, that, is, that is great. Well, good morning, church. Good to see all of you here this morning. Before we jump into uh, the passage, I know a lot of you are gardeners, aren't you? Do you know how cucumbers become pickles? They go through a jarring experience. 
feel, feel free to use it with your gardening friends. They'll appreciate it. Hopefully they'll appreciate it. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Uh, gracious God, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for this time to gather together in your name. Uh, Lord, I, I, I thank you for the backdrop for me this morning. I thank you for uh, Bible school that will happen. I thank you, Father, for how your spirit moves in the hearts and minds of children. That you, Lord Jesus, uh, corrected your disciples and said, uh, don't keep the children from me. That you love children. And Lord, we pray that you would move par powerfully, that you would bless and uh, um, that you would use all those who are volunteering and that you would plant uh, spiritual seeds in the hearts and minds of those who will be assembling this week. I thank you, Lord, for what Vacation Bible School did in my life and how it, it prepared me for a time in which I could uh, and was ready to hear and receive the gospel and the gift of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we look at your word this day. I pray that you would do what only you can do through your Holy Spirit because you know where each of us are in our spiritual walk, in our journey. And I pray, Father, that you would uh, help us to uh, draw ever closer to you as we take in your truth and as we desire to... Uh, Put hands and feet to it and live it out. So bless this time, we pray, in the wonderful and powerful name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It was 1979. I and a number of my friends were on the road traveling to Cincinnati. Our destination was Kings Island. But our ultimate destination on that amusement park was the beast for it had just been uh, built in april of that year it was the biggest longest and fastest wooden roller coaster at that time and we were all very anxious and excited to get there and ride that monster and so uh, we uh, got to the park and as you do when you're young we ran to the other side of the park to get in line and it was quite a long line and we waited even longer in line because uh, we wanted to sit in the front seat and so I'm sitting in the front seat with my best friend and we're going up click 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 and we get to the top and you go over the top and you hang there because you got to wait for all of those other cars to get up to the top. And I look way, way down there, and there's this black little box. I'm wondering, what is that black little box? But it's, it, it only took just a little while until the last car went over and you whoosh, felt the weight of everything force you down very fast, and suddenly that black little box became very big, and I felt the cool air, and... You're in a tunnel and then up out the other side and around. Now, why do I tell you that? Well, we have a background here that kind of uh, really almost required a roller coaster story. But the reason I open with that is if you're a Christian this morning, your journey with God is kind of like a roller coaster ride. There are ups and downs. There will be moments of excitement and thrilling, and there will be moments in which, oh my goodness, what is coming next? And that's exactly what we witness in the early church with the disciples. They have moments of absolute exhilaration because God is moving and, and he's multiplying. Peter preached on Pentecost and 3,000 souls were saved. And, and the church is growing. And now uh, Peter and John have gone to the temple to worship God and to pray. And a man is right there along the gate as you enter in. The gate beautiful, it's called. And he's brought there every day. He's over 40 years old and he's never been able to walk. 
and he's begging for money. And he begs from Peter and John, and they say, we don't have gold, we don't have silver, but what we do have, we will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And Peter reaches down and grabs him by the hand, and he stands up, and the scriptures tell us he started walking and jumping and praising God. And guess what? A crowd assembled. Do you know when something happens, there's always a crowd have you noticed that? Uh, from time to time when we lived in Ironton and we would go down and visit Melinda's folks, we would be uh, on the freeway and we're going south and suddenly traffic would start slowing down. And then you'd start creeping along. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, what is up ahead of us? And come to find out a few miles down the road that there's an accident on the northbound side. There's nothing on the southbound side to obstruct any traffic whatsoever, but it comes to a cre screeching halt. Why? Because everybody's gawking at the northbound accident. Experienced that before? Peter declares to this man, in the name of Jesus, you can walk. And he's walking and jumping around, and a crowd assembles. And Peter takes advantage of that crowd, and he starts preaching a message to them. He lets them know that uh, this same Jesus who healed this man, the author of life, you sold him out. You wanted a murderer instead of him to be released. And he was killed, but God raised him from the dead. They're preaching about salvation and everlasting life, resurrection in Jesus' name. And guess what? They not only got a crowd, but they got some enemies of the gospel as well. For those from the Sanhedrin, especially the Sadducees, who didn't even believe in the resurrection, get word of this, and so they come, and he's not even done preaching, and Peter and John are arrested. And so they're thrown into jail overnight, and then they, uh, they, they face the court the next day. Now, <clears throat> before we actually jump in and make some observations, I just want to remind all of us, we, we live in a very uh, blessed country in which I don't think we really experience persecution like many of our brothers and sisters around the world. We may have people that take offense to our faith, but we don't uh, have quite what brothers and sisters do in other countries where their lives are on the line for their faith in Jesus. But we should, as followers of Jesus, expect persecution. Jesus made that clear. In John chapter 15, he said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. Jesus is making that classic argument of greater to lesser. What's true of me will be true of my followers as well. The world persecuted me. You can expect opposition as well in this world. Now, what was the cause of this persecution that happened, this very first persecution of the early church? Two things. Two things. And the first one is they were doing good, right? They healed a man. In fact, uh, Peter, when he addresses the court, he makes it clear uh, what, what the problem is. Because he says, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed. He starts his discussion that way. He goes, okay, guys, let's be honest. The reason you threw us in jail last night the reason uh, we're even standing before you today is because we did a good deed. 
we, we, we did a good thing. This poor man had been crippled for uh, over 40 years, and now he's walking. He's there. Uh, they can't deny the sign. They can't deny what good is being done. Now, church, if you're doing bad, if you're being obnoxious, if you're being difficult, and someone has an objection, don't call that persecution. That's not what it is. But if you're doing right, and you're standing up for right, and you're making a difference in the world, uh, then yes, when there's opposition, that can indeed be persecution. Peter, the same Peter who's in this story, later writes a letter. In the first letter that he wrote to the church, in 1 Peter 2.20, he says, But how is it to you, to your credit, if you receive a beating for doing wrong and enduring it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, it is commendable for before God. In other words, if you're doing the right thing and you suffer for that, God will reward you. If you're doing the wrong thing and you suffer, guess what? That's justice. You, you, you received what you deserved. So first, it needs to be a good thing. Second, it needs to be in Jesus' name. And that's the key to everything. Peter declared to him, in Jesus' name, walk. And Peter declares to them that <coughs> you and all the people of Israel, it is in the name of Jesus of Nazareth that this man walks. Tony Evans, a noted pastor and author and radio a speaker in Dallas, was once asked to do the opening prayer for the Texas State Legislature in Austin. Right before he uh, got up to go to the podium, uh, an individual uh, told him that they were honored to have him here and to uh, pray before the legislature, but they cautioned him not to mention Jesus' name because Jesus is offensive to a number of people. It's a dangerous thing to tell a preacher of the gospel not to say Jesus' name. And so Dr. Evans proceeded to the podium and he prayed. And he said something like this. Almighty God, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, for only in the name of Jesus Christ do I have the right to be in, to you, in your holy presence. For it is through the blood of Jesus that I am made right and able to enter into your throne. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would convict and move amongst these legislature this day that you would bring them to their knees and help them to recognize what is right and what is wrong and to know for certain that they will answer to you for all that they do. And I pray all these things in the powerful and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. He wasn't invited back. Those men... Peter and John made it clear it was in Jesus' name that they did it. It wasn't in their power that that man was healed. It was in Jesus' name. There is a reason that we pray in Jesus' name. Uh, Jesus, it's not like we tack on his name at the end so we can get what we want. No. It's kind of like, you know, that signature on a check that authorizes that amount of money. Now, if I go to the bank and I write a check for a million dollars to cash, are you with me? Do you know where I'm going with this? Because if you don't, you have no idea what I make. Because the authorization has to have a backup to it, right? But see, when, when we come in Jesus' name, that means we, we are invoking the authority of Jesus on what we prayed. And I'll tell you why I pray in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name to protect me from me. Now, let me explain a minute. Have any of you ever prayed for something and you find out later you're really glad you didn't get what you asked for? 
Yes, because Jesus knows better. And when we pray in Jesus' name, the Father will only grant it if it's actually the will of Jesus. And I'm telling you, you want the will of Jesus because that is what's best. And it was the will of Jesus that that man would be healed. And it was the will of Jesus that through the witness of that man and Peter and John then making him known that there's a tremendous increase in the kingdom because it says before Peter was even done preaching and and they arrested him, now they numbered 5,000. They were 3,000 at Pentecost and now they're 5,000 from that assembly, that spontaneous group uh, that were witnesses so therein lies what was the objection what's the response of the early church what's the response of the apostles in this situation there's a tremendous transformation that has taken place within those disciples first of all they're spirit filled it says then peter filled with the holy spirit in verse 8 then he addresses them now i had never heard this song that mela sang until 8 o'clock this morning. And I love the song. And it's, it's got a powerful message. Because do you know what the antithesis of faith is? It's not unbelief. It's fear. It is fear. Fear will always keep you from doing what God will call you to do in faith. It is the devil's way of keeping us down and keeping us where he wants us to be. And the only way that you will be able to, as Mela sang for us, say goodbye to fear and break up with fear is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because you can't do it on your own and you can't declare it on your own. You can't just say, I'm not going to have any fear in my life anymore. No, you have to be filled with the Spirit. And by being filled with the Spirit, you're full of the assurance of the love of God for you because the Scriptures say that perfect love casts out all fear. And when you know you're His, and you know He loves you, even in spite of you sometimes, then you can step out in boldness and follow in faith. And that's exactly what Peter does. Is he's full of the Spirit, and the second thing is he speaks with boldness. Now think about it. We, we got the names of the characters. Ananias, Caiaphas. Do those names sound familiar? They should, because those were the very same guys that were the head of the, the whole court that had Jesus sent to the Romans to be executed. Now, they followed the law this time, it was late in the day, and so they just threw Peter and John in prison. What did they do with Jesus? They had court at night, which was against the law. And remember where Peter was? He was outside, outside the house in the courtyard. And he is full of fear, right? Because on three different occasions through that night, he was asked, Aren't you one of those Galileans? Aren't you one of his followers? I can tell by the way you talk. You, you've, you're one of his. And three times Peter denies him. And now there's a total transformation in Peter's life because he's seen the resurrected Lord. He's witnessed that Jesus is not in the tomb and death has no power over him. And now he's, he's got to declare to a man that's now with him, probably still jumping up and down with excitement, that in Jesus' name, you're healed. You're whole. And so there's this holy boldness that Peter now has when he addresses them. Peter Cartwright, uh, a great circuit writer, Methodist preacher, that traveled throughout the state of Illinois, he, uh, he was uncompromising. He actually moved north from Tennessee because he, uh, he opposed slavery. And on one particular Sunday, um, he was scheduled to preach, and uh, the leaders of the church, 
uh, made it known to him, they said, President Andrew Jackson is here. And knowing that uh, Cartwright was uh, well known for uh, speaking his mind and not really caring uh, what people thought, he just spoke what he believed God wanted him to say. They said, please don't say anything offensive to the commander in chief. And so when it came time, Peter Cartwright came up to the pulpit and he said, I understand President Andrew Jackson is here and I have been requested to guard my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell unless he repents. And then he pre proceeded to uh, preach his sermon. People were kind of gasping and they were wondering what's going to happen after the service when the president addresses him. And after the service, most certainly, President Andrew Jackson uh, addressed Peter Cartwright and he said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip the world. There is a holy boldness that can come when we're declaring and saying what is true by God's word. You can be as timid as a mouse and still there can be a boldness when you know it's right and when you stand on the side of right. Now, the message was not just Holy Spirit filled and full of boldness, but it was personal too. It was very personal because uh, Peter declared to them, Jesus of Nazareth healed this man, and he says, whom you crucified and God raised from the dead. Now, I pointed my finger on purpose because I am almost certain it's not in the scripture there, but I hear as Peter says it, and I don't think he could have said it any other way, but you, whom you crucified, he is being very pointed. He is being very intentional to let them know he is not standing in fear in any way. We're talking months earlier. They condemned Jesus, and now he's saying, you crucified him. But he's, he's alive, and he healed this man, and you need to know that. And people, it has to be personal. The message always has to be personal. It was many years ago in my home church that I was asked to do this special music, and I sang a song. I didn't sing that well, but I'm going to read to you some of the words of that song. The city was Jerusalem. The time was long ago. The people called him Jesus. The crime was the love he showed. And I'm the one to blame. I caused all the pain. He gave himself the day he wore my crown. The preacher preached that morning at the conclusion of like any other Sunday, an invitation was extended and a young lady from our church came forward and professed her faith in Jesus Christ. The next Sunday, it's a wonderful Christian family, had two, two daughters. Uh, the next Sunday, uh, her dad made a point to come up and talk to me. And he said, it was your song that got her. As you sang the chorus, he gave himself the day he wore my crown. She sat there and said, Daddy, I put Jesus to the cross, didn't I? I have met and talked to people who have grown up in church and they believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world but they never take that personal step of accepting him as their savior. It is a personal relationship. It is a personal message. Until you and I respond to Jesus and surrender our life to him who gave his life for us, it's just a, it, it's kind of abstract. And it can become very personal. When you say, yes, Jesus, thank you for taking what I deserved. 
and I receive you as my Lord and my King. And the last thing about the message, the response to this persecution is that Peter declares a universal truth. We live in a world that doesn't believe in absolute truth anymore. We live in a world where uh, everything is supposed to be kind of subjective. But there are some things that are not subjective at all. And one of them is that Peter declares, and it is true, that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is one way to God, and that, that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. And in this world of pluralism where everybody wants multiple ways and they want to choose their own path and they want to declare to God, this is how I'll do it. And somehow make God out to be a bad guy if he says there's only one way. And let's face it, in our sinful nature, we don't like to be told things, do we? Have you been to the store with the arrows in the aisle? There's something within us that wants to rebel, right? I mean, the first time I noticed an arrow, I was halfway through the aisle, and I'm going, oh, I'm going the wrong way. I'm not accustomed to looking down and looking for arrows. But there's something within us that we don't want to be told there's only one way. But let me ask you, if you're in a burning building and there are firefighters and they say, this is the only way out. Is that a bad thing for them to tell you that? Or are they heroes? And there is one way out for us. And it's Jesus. And the amazing thing, the amazing thing that we call grace is that God didn't, he owed us nothing. The amazing thing is that he made a way. And so that universal truth needs to be proclaimed. Um, we sang Waymaker for the second time this Sunday. I know it's, it's new to our congregation. If you listen to WBGL, you've probably been hearing it for the last couple of months. Uh, it's a beautiful song. It declares some very powerful truths about the living God. But you know what? It's not a new song at all. It's just new to the United States. It was written by a Nigerian woman who's a worship leader. It was written like six years ago. But what, what she declared in that song that we all go, oh, I love this. It says great things about God. Why does it resonate with us too? Because it's not subject to culture. Because there are universal truths about God that, that anybody who comes to faith in Him, your, your, your heart beats in you, this is right, this is good, this is scriptural. And I want you to, that, that's the message, I want you to also see the resemblance through the persecution because I, I think sometimes we... Uh, look at the Bible characters and we read about them and we put them on a pedestal like they're, they're these super spiritual people and they're just like us. What did the Sanhedrin, what did those uh, religious leaders conclude about Peter and John? Well, first of all, they concluded they were ordinary people. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized they were unschooled, ordinary people. Unschooled. Literally in the Greek, it means unlettered. It means they didn't have much of an education. They were fishermen by trade. They didn't have any d advanced degrees. They were just ordinary guys. And then the main thing that they noticed is that they had been with Jesus. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. You will never be stronger in public than the strength you draw from the time that you spend with the Lord Jesus in private. You see, 
we, we, we will not be able to be the witness that we were meant to be if we don't spend time alone with him. They noticed. They saw a difference. And they were enemies of the gospel, and they still recognized these guys, they've been with Jesus. He's, he's had an impact on them. I'll conclude with uh, these two verses from Corinthians and a few comments. Paul writes, But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Paul's using the analogy of a parade. And he's saying, for followers of Jesus, there should be this aroma. There, there should, it should emit from us that we know Jesus. I've had some peaches this week. I love peaches. It's one of my favorite things about summer. There's just certain fruits and things that you just make summer for me. And before I ever bite into the peach, I smell it. That sweet, if you like peaches, you know what I'm talking about, right? There, there's the aroma as part of the enjoyment of the sweet, juicy peach. There's an aroma of a Christian if we spend time with Jesus that will have an impact on people. Rex Cooper over here, a fine man, a, a, a great man to spend time with. I also believe that anybody who th they'll 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 conclude he's he's really good to be around and if they spend any time at all they'll know why they'll know jesus rules his life there's an aroma <laughs> there's a presence there's a presence beyond him that attracts people to him because of the one he's given his life to. So should be true of all of us. And we can be that witness. And people, don't be surprised sometimes when the witness goes forth that you're on the right of your life. Sometimes the response is thrilling and wonderful, and you see transformation. And sometimes you see the devil's got a hold of someone, and there's some real opposition. But persevere, do the right thing, follow after the Lord wholeheartedly, and he will use you, and he will advance his kingdom through you. Pray with me, would you? Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for how you have revealed to us uh, your work through the, the apostles by the power of the Spirit. And Father, I pray for everyone here this morning. Uh, Lord, there may be some here this morning who know you in name, but don't know you personally. And I pray that today might be the day that they ask you to forgive them of their sins, that they would turn from trying to live life on their own and entrust themselves to you. And I pray, Father, for my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that you would help all of us to banish fear from our lives through the filling of your Spirit, to have the boldness that comes only by having a personal relationship with you, to stand firm on truth and declare through how we live who we know as Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. May he receive all the glory and honor, we pray in his holy name. Amen.
Now would you uh, join me and in singing Wherever He Leads I'll Go. Please bow with me in prayer. Oh, Lord Jesus, as we have sung, so may it be true. Uh, we're going into a new week, and we pray, Lord, that you would lead us every step of the way. We all have a tendency, myself included, to ask you, Lord, to be with us. You already promised you'd be with us. You told us that you would never leave us nor forsake us. Help us, Lord, to reorient our way of thinking. Help us to pray every day, Lord, lead me this day. Lead me in who I'm talking to. Lead me in where I'm working, whatever I'm doing. Lead my thoughts, lead my emotions, lead my interactions so that I truly am your witness, that I'm being guided by your hand every step of the way so that you receive the honor that is due you. And I have that sweet aroma of Jesus that can impact others. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Thank you for watching Joy for the Journey, a presentation of worship from the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. To learn more about the ministries of our church, learn how you can join us in worship, or to support this television ministry, contact us at 1804 South 9th Street, Mattoon, Illinois, 61938. You can also visit us on the World Wide Web at www.joyforthejourney.org. 
First Baptist Church, a church where friends are made.